Welcome back to Psychological Science, Lecture 18, Psychopathology. Psychopathology, also called mental disorders or mental illness, is perhaps the major application of psychological science. <clears throat> In the United States alone, probably 4% of the population has had a severe mental disorder, defined as a condition involving distress or suffering, some impairment of functioning, of work, of play, of the ability to enjoy other people's company, and probably some internal malfunction. That's the definition of a psychological disorder. In the United States, probably half of people have had at least a mild disorder at some point in their lives. That means a healthy percentage of you who are watching this video today. The economic costs of psychological disorders are staggering in terms of treatment and lost productivity, certainly in the hundreds of billions of dollars, to say nothing of the costs in suffering, the person himself or herself, and that person's family and uh, friends and associates. This uh, graph from the Global Burden of Disease tries to estimate how much of the uh, disability worldwide from all sources combined, that is, how much impairment in the lives of people can be attributed to mental and behavioral disorders. And as you can see, it's almost a quarter, uh, rivaling uh, musculo, mus uh, musculoskeletal disorders, um, cardiovascular and circulatory disorders, uh, tropical diseases and malaria. This is how much psychological disorders impairs the functioning of people worldwide. Now, there are two misconceptions about psychological disorders. The first is that somehow they're, they're not real pathologies, that people who claim to have psychological disorders are just lazy, self-absorbed whiners, and all they need is a good kick in the pants. A complementary misconception about my mental disorders is that they aren't real because they are uh, merely uh, free spirits, non-conformists, that a diagnosis of a uh, psychopathological condition is merely society's attempt to label and repress non-conformists, visionary, and rebels. This was a view that was popular in the 70s because of a famous but highly misleading book by the, psych the psychiatrist Thomas Zaz called The Myth of Mental Illness, which then made its way into m much of the art of the 60s and 70s, perhaps most famously the movie starring Jack Nicholson, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. The other misconception, really in the uh, opposite direction, is that mental disorders are just like physical diseases. This is sometimes called the medical model that there is some uh, identifiable organic malfunction in the brain, some chemical imbalance, some anatomical uh, malformation. Or that mental disorders have some simple identifiable cause, a gene, a particular life experience. The reality is that mental disorders are real, but they are poorly understood. When I was a graduate student, I was uh, dating a woman who was a a uh, graduate student in clinical psychology, and my grandmother asked what she was studying. I said she was in clinical psychology. She asked what that was, and I explained it was about uh, mental disorders, about depression and schizophrenia. And she said, and they can be cured? Isn't science wonderful? Well, would that that were true. Uh, in reality, psychological disorders, though real, are still admittedly poorly understood. How do you even uh, measure the and detect the presence of psychopathology. One problem is that many disorders are, can be seen as extremes along a continuum. So for example, we all experience fear and anxiety. If it is a part of our personality, if we experience it a bit more than, than normal, we might call it a neurotic personality. Still more extreme, you might have the architect ar archetype of the uh, neurotic Woody Allen character in his early movies. And still farther on the continuum, you would have the uh, psychopathology of phobias and panic disorders, which I will explain soon. 
Another example is that all of us have to allocate attention. We had a lecture on, on, it, on uh, attention. We have to have standards of competence. We have to be oriented toward uh, details. If you uh, exhibit more of that trait than the typical person, you might be considered to be conscientious on, in one of the uh, big five personality dimensions. Still more, and you might be the kind of person we call anal retentive, as you recall from the lecture on psychoanalysis. But when it starts to shade into pathology, when it starts to interfere in people's happiness and productive lives, then we call it a disorder, namely obsessive compulsive disorder. And psychopathology and ordinary variation in personality traits are measured in similar ways. For example, using projective and objective tests, such as, such as the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory that I introduced in the uh, preceding lecture, or in symptom checklists that therapists will fill out for a patient that they are seeing. The most psychological disorders, in other words, are fuzzy family resemblance categories. You remember those from the lecture on concepts and reasoning. This is yet another domain of life where that, uh, that uh, construct, that uh, understanding of concepts introduced by Ludwig Wittgenstein uh, provides insight in what we are trying to understand. This is a matrix from your textbook, which has uh, as its rows a number of symptoms, relationship problems, a hostile, blames others, um, self-absorbed, self-critical, over, uh, overtly emotional. The columns correspond to personality disorders, including uh, paranoid, antisocial, histrionic, narcissistic, and so on. The uh, beige squares indicate that the particular symptom is a central feature of the disorder. The uh, blue-gray squares indicate that it is uh, prominent, but not um, absolutely necessary. And as you can see, it's a pretty patchwork, patchy matrix. There are a lot of symptoms that are shared in different combinations across the uh, mental disorders. They are not crisply uh, defined, they, in that sense, are very unlike physical disorders such as COVID or measles or atherosclerosis. Let me give you some examples of personality disorders, that is, variation along the uh, various combinations of the big five that may not quite shade into psychopathology, but uh, might be on the border. They can be distinguished from clinical disorders, where there genuinely is suffering and uh, impairment. There is antisocial personality disorder related to what we call less formally psychopathy or sociopathy, and I'll give a, a definition from the standard diagnostic manual. Quote, a pervasive pattern of disregard for and violation of the rights of others that begins in childhood or early adolescence and continues into adulthood. They have an impoverished moral sense or conscience and may have a history of crime, legal problems, impulsive and aggressive behavior. Uh, antisocial personality disorder is diagnosed three times as often in men as in women. As the textbook makes clear, some of these sex differences may come from biases in diagnosis, but a good part of them uh, uh, reflect genuine differences in the statistical distribution of these conditions in men and women. Paranoid personality disorder, defined as a long-standing suspiciousness and generalized mistrust of others. Hyper, they are hypersensitive, easily feel slighted, and habitually relate to the world by vigilant scanning of the environment for clues or suggestions that may validate their fears or biases. And by the way, with a number of these personality disorders, no doubt they, uh, you recognize them in uh, people that you know. Histrionic personality disorder, a pattern of excessive emotionality and attention seeking, including an excessive need for approval and inappropriately seductive behavior, usually beginning in early adulthood. These individuals are lively, dramatic, vivacious, enthusiastic, and flirtatious. And uh, this is a condition that is diagnosed uh, approximately four times as often in women 
as in men. Narcissistic personality disorder, sometimes loosely uh, connected to megalomania, a pervasive pattern of grandiosity in either fantasy or behavior, a constant need for admiration, a lack of empathy, commonly associated with despots, tyrants, and populists. No further comment. Borderline personality disorder, instability of interpersonal relationships, self-image and affect and marked impulsivity, frantic efforts to avoid real or imagined abandonment, unstable self-image or sense of self, inappropriate intense anger or difficulty controlling anger, and alternation between extremes of idealization and devaluation. This is a symptom sometimes called splitting. If you know someone where it seems that on uh, Wednesday, you're the most wonderful person in the world, and they just love you. And then on Thursday, you're the most selfish, uh, egotistical person in the world, and they hate you. That's kind of a symptom of borderline personality disorder. The term originally referred to the borderline between uh, neurosis, a mild psychological disorder, and psychosis, a extreme pathology. Uh, it, it is uh, dubious, dubiously applicable, but that was the historical origin of the term. Borderline personality disorder is diagnosed about three times as often in women as in men. Let me turn now to clinical disorders. This is genuine psychopathology, where there is an impairment in uh, happiness and in functioning, and at least there is a suspicious a suspicion that there is something uh, different, something going on in, in the brain. There's a, a family of disorders that are, can be uh, conveniently lumped together as anxiety disorders, such as phobias. Perhaps 10% of the American population suffers from phobias. There are specific phobias, like of snakes and spiders and heights. I alluded to them in the lecture on motion. There's also a more generalized social phobia, or agoraphobia. There's a panic disorder. That is a condition in which people overinterpret their own signs of arousal, their own fight-or-flight response. Shortness of breath, pounding heart, clammy skin, butterflies in, in the stomach, uh, palpitations. And it launches them on a vicious circle where, as they feel these physical symptoms of anxiety, they uh, assume there must be something terrible uh, happening out there that would cause them to feel so uh, anxious and upset. That concentration on their physical symptoms uh, increases the anxiety, which then increases the uh, physical symptoms in a uh, dreadful positive feedback loop. A generalized anxiety disorder, perhaps 6% of the American population, consi uh, consists of a uh, hypervigilance and a worry about many things. This is, these are the people who we sometimes just call neurotic. It probably can be tied to an overactive amygdala, that is a organ in the brain that has come up a number of times in this course, and combined with perhaps less inhibition from the prefrontal cortex, that is the part of the brain that evaluates the totality of the situation, puts things into perspective, and regulates emotion. It's impossible to really understand <clears throat> clinical disorders from a verbal description alone. And so for a number of the conditions that I'm going to talk about in this lecture, I have found short video clips that not only give you more of a feel for what this is like, how this actually manifests itself in behavior and emotional expression, but it, I hope it will also uh, instill a kind of compassion for, for these people to witness their suffering in a more tangible way than simply a verbal description. So this is a, uh, a, a gentleman who has a uh, generalized anxiety disorder uh, uh, manifested as agoraphobia. Oh. Agoraphobia is one of the commonest phobias. It's a fear of fear itself, a fear of having a panic attack in public. This has meant taking holidays was almost impossible for Carmine and caused problems with his family. We want to go on holiday, but deep down inside, as it got closer and closer to going on holiday, I felt like I was going to my doom. 
What if I don't feel good? What if I want to go home? What if I get stuck in traffic? And then we would get to our destination. As soon as she would unpack my bag, I would say, I want to go home. I don't feel good, I want to go home. Joanne Weiss also used to be phobic. She was housebound for five years, but now works as a phobia aide. Using a form of behavior therapy, she's hoping she can help Carmine overcome his fear. But she knows from personal experience, agoraphobics can be very tricky. Sometimes I could be waiting for them and they just don't show up. And I will make a phone call and I'll hear every excuse that you can possibly think of. And some that you wouldn't believe. But I used to use them myself, so I'm on to everyone. Manhattan is a scary place for most phobics. Especially if you're agoraphobic. It's like that Alice in Wonderland syndrome when you feel very small and everything is very big. Another anxiety disorder is, has become prominent in popular culture, post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. Perhaps 10 to 30 percent of American combat veterans report PTSD. It is triggered by a traumatic experience and in that way can be differentiated from other anxiety disorders, such as an experience of being raped or tortured or uh, being in a natural disaster or a car accident. Among the symptoms are re-experiencing the traumatic event in nightmares or uh, even in waking hours as flashbacks. A sense of uh, uh, general hyperarousal, being always edgy and uh, nervous and vigilant. Manifested as insomnia, irritability, an exaggerated startle response and poor concentration. Avoidance of situations and thoughts that are vaguely reminiscent of the traumatic event accompanied by an emotional numbing and social withdrawal. Obsessive compulsive disorder, another anxiety disorder, but of a different character. Perhaps 1.5% of Americans uh, report it. The symptoms incl are, uh, include ruminations, thoughts that you just can't get out of your head that play themselves over and over again. Rituals, people who can't go to bed without arranging the pillows in a particular configuration or can't uh, eat unless every piece of cutlery is set just right. Checking, they keep going back into the house to make sure that they turn the stove off. And horrific temptations, thoughts that are uh, would be unspeakably horrible if they carried them out. Not that there's any chance that they would carry, carry them out, but it would be so horrible if they did that they can't stop thinking about them, such as people who are uh, hesitant to get onto a subway, subway platform because they think that uh, of how terrible it would be if they push someone into the path of an oncoming train, people who can't set foot in a synagogue because they're afraid in the middle of services they'll stand up and yell Heil Hitler. Not that they have the slightest chance of, of doing it, but the dread of how horrific it would be if they did calls for a constant vigilance to repress that uh, temptation. Let me give you a uh, glimpse of uh, what it is like to have obsessive compulsive disorder. Stephanie Laudenslager has another form of obsessive compulsive disorder. Okay. Her obsessions center around her baby son, Jake. When I come to stop signs, I have to look at him while I'm stationary uh, for fear that someone's going to come up and take him, you know, open the door. I have to start the car before I take my eyes off him. Ah! When I'm moving, I figure nobody can get to him. Stephanie's protective maternal instincts have gone into overdrive. It's a form of OCD that sometimes afflicts new mothers. Like many people with obsessive compulsive disorder, Stephanie also has a fear of contamination. She avoids litter or spots on the pavement in case the wheels of the buggy touch something deadly. Passers-by pose a double threat. They could kidnap Jake or contaminate him. Sometimes it's hard for me to go for a walk because I can never get home because I'm constantly having to 
turn around and go the other way because there's somebody coming. If somebody's walking towards me, then I get frantic. No, that's... Uh, keep, please keep him on a leash. And it's a fear of never knowing if he was contaminated. It's like never... I'll never know if that person who walked by touched him. And that will eat away at me. Stephanie is particularly obsessed with one source of danger. If I had to be specific, I would say AIDS is probably my number one fear, or anything that's contracted uh, through bodily fluids. Before Jake was born, Stephanie was diagnosed as having OCD. Her obsessional fear of contamination leads to compulsive rituals which she uses to manage her anxiety. When I am going to interact with Jake in some way, I have to be certain my hands have been just cleaned. And they have to be scoured clean. The urge to perform these compulsions is so strong that in this half hour, Stephanie washed her hands 22 times. It's torturous. Um, I wash my hands continuously. I know I try to stop myself, but it's almost like my feet begin moving for the sink, and I'm trying to tell myself not to do it, but I'm desperate and I have to. And the washing ritual is complex and has to be performed absolutely correctly three times. I have to lather up my hands completely, uh, drawing my fingers through my other hand. The water has to be as hot as it can be. I start with my forefinger and scrape under my left thumb, and then I switch to my thumbnail and go to my forefinger, the middle finger, ring finger, and then... I get to the pinky and I switch to this hand and go back and forth several times and that just gets the first layer of contamination off because I still feel since I scraped under my nails that it's somewhere on me. So I have to get another pump and do it all over again. And this is really the, the one that I feel cleans me because now my nails are clean and now I'm just going to scrub my hands and then I have to do a finishing rinse. This is the part that's hard because the water's really hot, burning, but sometimes I keep my hands under there just to feel better. And then I get my towel. And I will be careful not to touch the garbage when I put this in, so I have to... Oh! And it touched my hand, so I'm back. But it dries your hands out and your hands crack. And then it gets to the point where I, I can't close them more than this because the knuckles will crack open and bleed. OCD, like, like other uh, psychological disorders, can often be a subject of um, banter and comedy and teasing. But as that clip shows, people who suffer from these conditions uh, really do suffer. This woman was on the verge of tears and her life was uh, a kind of living hell because of this condition. Major depressive disorder, speaking of lives that are living hell, must be distinguished from depression. All of us have uh, undergone periods of depression. But to be called a major depressive disorder, it must last more than two weeks, uh, longer than, than uh, two weeks, and, and uh, severely impair the person's functioning. Perhaps 7% of the American population suffers from major depressive disorder in a year. It's about 50% uh, more common in women. It's characterized by sadness, of course, a loss of energy and initiative, a sense of hopelessness. Not only are things bad now, but there is an expectation that they will never get better. It's inconceivable that a person who's suffering from major depression in their own minds will ever get better. A sense that they themselves are worthless and a lack of, lack of optimism which paradoxically can uh, be accurate. There is a symptom called depressive realism in which uh, ordinarily functioning people often are 
a bit too optimistic about their prospects. They think they are less likely than the average person to suffer from an accident or an illness in playing games of chance. We all tend to overestimate our odds of winning. And people who are depressed often are more accurate. Their lack of optimism is sometimes more accurately calibrated to external reality. And there's a loss of pleasure. That food doesn't taste good, sex holds no appeal, friends aren't worth the bother, hobbies uh, are, uh, are become boring. The condition is sometimes called anhedonia, a law, uh, absence of pleasure. This can lead to a vicious circle because people who suffer from major depression will withdraw from all of the things in life that, that, that give them pleasure, withdraw from social interaction, from friends and family, which makes them all the more depressed, which makes them withdraw even farther. Again, uh, a verbal description really can't do justice to the awfulness of major depression, so let me show a, a video clip from a young man who is uh, suffering from that condition. Well, it's, uh... Wednesday night, I just got in from work not long ago. I actually had a very good day today. Um, and I'm certainly, at the moment, out of the deep depression that I seem to have been in for a while. And I find it hard, really, to see any future. So things seem again. pretty black, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Um, sort of, what's the point? What's the point of doing anything? Mm -hmm. um, I think I feel constantly exhausted. Everything I do is, yeah, always exhausts me, and I feel ex just exhausted mentally rather than physically. Oh, I've got a badge. <laughs> downhill from here, it says. It's all downhill from here. <laughs> it's all downhill from here. Probably right. Three decades. It's not a bad cricket score. There's so many times when I never thought I'd get this far, so in some ways I'm quite pleased. Why's that, Steve? Well, I, I believe it's down. It's down in most parts of my illness. Uh, it's a depression. Um, it's a very debilitating uh, illness. It's not just about being a bit sad every now and again. Um, it actually takes over your life and uh, you can't... Uh, it, sounds a bit, it, sounds, it sounds strange, but it's just impossible to do things. It just is not possible. You don't have the willpower, you don't have the motivation. When I was 10 years old, my mother, she um, committed suicide um, whilst on a family shopping trip. It's probably very difficult to trust anybody ever in that life ever again. And I tend to have gone to life through life either trying to build myself up into this thing I'm not. In order to get people to like me and need me and want me. I'm getting depressed just watching it. And that itself is part of the tragedy of depression. Uh, depressed people aren't much fun to be around. It's not only do they withdraw from social uh, interaction, face-to-face -face company, but other people are less inclined to deal with them, which can only deepen the condition. Again, calling for understanding and compassion to people who uh, fall into this terrible condition. Bipolar disorder used to be called manic depressive disorder, and uh, that tells a story, about 1, 1 to 4% of the American population. It's defined as depression alter, alternating with mania, mania referring to uh, a rush of energy, of euphoria, of confidence, of risk-taking, of delusions of grandeur, uh, impulsivity, often characterized by spending sprees and uh, hypersexuality. The manic phase of bipolar disorder can sometimes shade into psychosis, into outright delusions and paranoia. Which leads us to schizophrenia, perhaps the most 
pervasive and uh, the, the most um, debilitating of mental disorders. About 1% of the American population are, is uh, schizophrenic. Now, schizophrenia has to be distinguished from a condition, a uh, controversial condition called multiple personality disorder. And many people, when they think of schizophrenia, they think of uh, the kind of person who has a number of different selves, a number of different identities, it's even used in the common vernacular to refer to a, as we say, a split personality. Well, sometimes I think I should major in, in art history, and other times I think I should major in theoretical physics. I'm really schizophrenic about my uh, academic career. Now, that's actually not what schizophrenia consists of. Despite the etymology, it literally does mean split mind, but that is not what the term refers to. Schizophrenia is often <clears throat> characterized in terms of its positive symptoms and its negative symptoms. The positive symptoms uh, most flagrantly include disordered, that is, illogical thought and speech, delusions, that is, beliefs that are patently false, sometimes hallucinations, the actual perceptual experience of something present in the immediate environment. The negative symptoms are sometimes called flattened affect. People with schizophrenia sometimes just can't get uh, aroused or fearful or excited or happy. They have a, a, a monotone of emotional experience. That's the negative symptom. Once again, I, uh, you can only appreciate it if you uh, listen to a person with schizophrenia. This is a clip that I showed you in the very first lecture, and it is uh, now that you know what schizophrenia is, it's worth uh, attending to the symptoms as shown in this. Please sit down. How are you doing? I'm doing so hot. I think and feel as though people have called me here to electrocute me, judge me, put me in jail, or kill me, electrocute me because of some of the sins I've been in. Is this a new feeling for you? main thing is don't get excited, but the thing is, is uh, it's not a new feeling, no. I, uh, I'm scared of people. It must be very frightening for you, though. It feels so like you're scared, about to get killed. I'm so scared, I can tell you that picture's got a headache. Can you tell me more about that? The picture has a headache, could you? You want to know? Yes, I do. Okay, when a sperm and an egg go together to make a baby, only one sperm goes up in the egg. And when they touch, there's two contact points that touch before the other two. And then it's carried up into the egg. And when they fuse, it's like nuclear fusion, except it's human fusion. There's a mass loss of the proton. One heat abstraction goes up in the electron, spins around, comes back down into the proton to form the mind. And the mind can be reduced to one atom. You saw there an example of disordered thinking. The picture has a headache. Now, it isn't a delusion in the sense that the picture, in fact, feels just fine. A picture is not the kind of thing that could have a headache. That's an example of disordered thinking. You also saw the um, uh, literal interpretation of words, where the fusion of an egg and a sperm was somehow equated with nuclear fusion. These are sometimes called clang associations and other symptom of schizophrenia, where uh, the same word used with two different meanings or even two similar words are held to have some kind of deep cosmic significance, failing to appreciate that, uh, the, that a word consists of an arbitrary pairing of a sound and a meaning, as we discussed in the lecture on language. There's a whole other category of uh, disorders that are um, studied under the domain of psychopathology, which probably veer more into actual identifiable physiological disorders. There's Down syndrome and other forms of retardation, now uh, more often called intellectual uh, developmental disorders. There's ADD, attention deficit uh, disorder, ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Uh, 
autism, which we discussed in the lecture on cognitive development, specific language impairment, discussed in the lecture on nature and nurture, uh, and uh, a number of others that are uh, that veer into neurological diseases. Well, what I've given you is an inventory, a taxonomy, a kind of laundry list, and it raises the question, what causes mental disorders? Now, there are all too many glib and bogus theories that have often captured the attention of the public and the, and the uh, media. There are innumerable bogus theories that attribute mental disorders to childhood experiences, of which perhaps the most notorious was the theory that autism was caused by an icebox mother, that is, a mother who did not appropriately shower a child with affection and warmth. The idea that schizophrenia was a response to mothers putting you in a double bind, kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't, and the way that the child copes with a, uh, that kind of impossible mother is by splitting the self into uh, two parts. There's an old uh, Jewish joke about a uh, mother who gives her uh, grown son two shirts for his birthday, and the first day he shows up wearing uh, the shirt, and the mother says, the other one you didn't like? That would be an example of a double bind. It, it is not the cause of schizophrenia. The uh, second law of behavioral genetics, which I discussed in the lecture in Kinship and Socialization, is that family upbringing has small to no effects on the adult personality. There is, in general, a vast over-attribution of both personality and, in particular, psychopathology to mothering, in particular, parenting in general, with little to no scientific basis. There was also the uh, bogus theory that phobias, such as little Albert's fear of uh, rats and uh, white fur coats and Santa Claus, was due to an episode of classical conditioning. Uh, there are also some uh, dubious biological theories that float out there that, for example, uh, perhaps the most pernicious and dangerous is the idea that autism is caused by vaccines, or more particularly by the preservative uh, thimerosal, which contains mercury that was uh, added to the uh, measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine to prevent it from uh, spoiling. That has been extensively studied, and it is complete and utter nonsense. Nonetheless, it retains popularity and uh, even bleeds into the resistance to taking the vaccine for COVID and other vaccines, which are uh, a dangerous myth on the, about the causation of psychopathology that has probably led to uh, thousands uh, of uh, deaths and needless suffering. There was an idea that schizophrenia was caused by a parasite from cats, the toxo, uh, toxoplasma uh, uh, parasite, also since debunked. There are very few psychological disor disorders for which we can identify a straightforward biological cause. This is certainly true of Down syndrome, which is caused by trisomy of chromosome 21, that is three copies instead of the usual two. Uh, nonetheless, it, it is certainly true that every one of the psychological disorders that I have discussed in this lecture are brain disorders. Uh, when you think about it, what else could they be? They're not disorders of the pancreas, and unless you believe in an immaterial soul, something has to be different in the brain of a person who reacts differently to their lives and surroundings than a typical member of the species. So while it is true that psychological disorders are brain disorders, that tells you very little. All it says is that something in there has to be different from what we call the normal state. For most other conditions, most other um, psychopathologies, uh, clinical psychologists tend to believe in what's gen generically called the stress diathesis model. Diathesis is a fancy, fancy schmancy term for a genetic predisposition, a vulnerability, and it would have to be triggered by some environmental stressor, abuse, trauma, loss, threat, disease, and so on. <clears throat> 
Here's a graph that conveys the idea and captures in part why it is so uh, difficult, so slippery to pin down the, what a psychological disorder consists of, how to differentiate it from normal variation, and what causes it. So on the uh, horizontal axis, there is situation severity from having a uh, charmed life with very few stressors all the way to a life filled with uh, challenges and trauma and pain and uh, insults. The dependent variable on the y-axis is the, in this case, we're talking about depression, the, the severity of the symptoms of depression. In general, you would expect that the tougher a life you have, the more depressed you would be. That would be represented by the diagonal. But uh, in fact, people vary in their resilience on the one hand or their vulnerability on the other. And that is captured by, in this case, a, a tilted normal distribution or bell curve. Uh, this might be the typical depressive severity of a person who undergoes that degree of environmental stress. But um, it shades off so that there are more vulnerable people who are more depressed than average. There are resilient people uh, who are less depressed than average, when the stressor increases, so let, let's say it is uh, in the middle of the range, then perhaps only the most vulnerable people, the mo one most susceptible to depression, will cross the line into major depression, into what would be diagnosed as suitable for clinical treatment, whereas the vast majority of people manage to um, take it in stride. If it is a a horrible trauma, a, uh, a rape or living through a war or a terrorist attack or a terrible accident, here you might have the majority of people reacting with depression so severe that it calls for treatment. But even then, there may be on the right tail of the distribution some resilient people who manage to cope and overcome that uh, trauma. So there's no simple answer to the, to the uh, question. Would a certain amount of uh, stressful experience cause you to become depressed? Nor is there a simple answer to the question, are there, are people, are there people who are always depressed or never depressed? It is a gradient that depends both on the diathesis, the uh, vulnerability, and on the degree of life hardship. This is taken from your textbook, and it displays the same idea in a different graphical format. Uh, in this graph, on the horizontal axis, you have predisposition to the disorder, the diathesis. On the vertical axis, you have the amount of stress, how horrible an experience you have gone through. Here, the dependent variable is shown in the shading in the body of the graph, where if you ha are, uh, have a resilient personality that is low uh, predisposition and you've lived a pretty easy life, then of course you're not going to be uh, depressed. You're not going to have the disorder, whatever the disorder is. If you have a uh, high predisp predisposition, if you are vulnerable, then even a medium amount of uh, stress might tip you over the border into uh, a disorder. Uh, conversely, if you are resilient, if you've got a low predisposition, then you might uh, survive even a high degree of stress, although with a uh, still resilient but not maximally resilient disposition, then a high amount of stress might tip you uh, over, where, where the diagonal in this graph refers to the border. Another depiction of the stress diathesis model. Well, what's diathesis? What's vulnerability? What's resilience? Where do they come from? Well, part of the answer is they do come from our genetic endowment. You'll recall from the lecture on kin and social socialization, the so-called first law of behavioral genetics, that all behavioral traits are uh, partly heritable. This refers uh, both to uh, ordinary psychological traits that vary in the population, such as intelligence and personality, uh, which is to say the big five. But it also pertains to mental disorders, 
pretty much every mental disorder that has been um, documented falls under the first law of behavioral genetics. Identical twins are more similar than fraternal twins. Adopted siblings are uh, less similar than biological siblings, and so on. Here's a graph from your textbook that illustrates one of these findings. The people being uh, considered are all adoptees, and they are divided into adoptees with schizophrenia, these two bars, and those uh, without schizophrenia, uh, neurotypical. Here you've got what is plotted here are the relatives of these uh, adopted children. The green bar over here uh, depicts the rate of schizophrenia among the biological relatives of adopted uh, people with schizophrenia. The blue bar shows the uh, likelihood of getting schizophrenia among the adopted, adoptive relatives of a, an adopted person with schizophrenia. And as you can see, biology matters. Uh, the relatives that you have never met, that you've not grown up with, that you've never interacted with, are much more likely to be schizophrenic if you are schizophrenic. Here you've got, just as a control, these are the adoptees without schizophrenia, and the biological relatives are in fact, in this case, a little less likely to have schizophrenia than the, uh, the, the uh, adoptive relatives, probably because if you uh, happen to fall into the lucky 99% of people without schizophrenia, then that may indicate that you have a uh, greater than average uh, resilience uh, a, or resistance to schizophrenia, and hence your relatives are less likely to get it. Again, from your textbook, this table shows some concordance rates for relatives of people with, uh, diagnosed with schizophrenia. The Identical twin of a person with schizophrenia is, has a pretty much a 50-50 chance of uh, being schizophrenic himself or herself. This has been known for many, many decades. When I was an undergraduate, there was a uh, famous trick question on the final exam of, a, of the course in abnormal psychology. What is the strongest statistical predictor of schizophrenia? And the answer was having an identical twin who's schizophrenic. Note, though, however, that despite sharing the entire genome, the, if a person has schizophrenia, their identical twin doesn't have a 100% chance of get, developing schizophrenia, but only a, in this case, a 48% chance. And I'll return to that puzzle. Fraternal twin, with whom the schizophrenic person shares Half their genes has a 17% chance of being schizophrenic. A uh, non-twin brother or sister, same degree of genetic relationship, but a different generation, born under different circumstances. There, the chance is cut in half to 9%. Half sibling, you share a mom, but not a dad, or vice versa. That's 25% uh, of your genes in common. That falls to 6%. And a first cousin, where you share eighth of your genes, that falls uh, to 2%. This is a, uh, pertains to relatives in the same generation. For relatives in later generations, uh, where the environment uh, is different, because one decade is not the same as the next, uh, once again, degree of genetic relatedness has a powerful effect on likelihood that a relative of a schizophrenic would, will uh, develop schizophrenia. Uh, again, 46% uh, of a child of two parents with schizophrenia. 13% chance if one of your parents is schizophrenic. 5% uh, chance if um, one of your uh, grandchildren, uh, uh, so grandparents is schizophrenic. Uh, and 4% uh, chance if a, uh, of a niece or nephew, uh, where the genetic relatedness is 25%. Just to put more precise estimates on the amount of variance in prevalence of the disorder that can be attributed to differences in the genes, that is heritabilities, when it comes to variation within the normal range, the big five personality dimensions, captured in the acronym OCEAN. The heritabilities are in the range of 0.4 to 0.6. Schizophrenia is higher, 0.6 to 0.8. Uh, 
depression, about 0.45. Again, here we're talking about major depression. Bipolar disorder, 0.6. Autism, a whopping 0.9, certainly putting the lie to the theory of the icebox mother. OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, around 0.45. Panic disorder, uh, still impressive, 0.3. One more graph from your textbook, just to show you the kinds of data that go into those estimates. Uh, here we have the relatives of people with a hist with, uh, who've been diagnosed with major depression, uh, four different kinds of, uh, of uh, relatedness uh, combined with the, whether uh, the person has had major depression or not. Now, uh, in the case in which you do not experience a particularly stressful life incident, then uh, regardless of your relatives, the chance of, being, uh, of undergoing depression is small. The four lines are meant to capture different degrees of genetic uh, predisposition. So the green line pertains to people who are identical twins of someone with a history of major depression, and you'd expect they have a full dose of these susceptibility genes. But nonetheless, it only actually manifests itself as depression if they've undergone a stressful event. If not, they are indistinguishable from the people with other degrees of susceptibility, such as the fraternal or non-identical or dizygotic twins of someone who has had a history of major depression. There they share uh, half their genes. Uh, that is enough to certainly elevate the chance of undergoing major depression if they have undergone a stressful life event. The red line refers to the fraternal twins of people with no history of depression. These are presumably the more resilient people, and if you share half your genes with someone who is resilient, you have a much lower chance of coming down with depression. And the most resilient people of all, would you'd expect to be the identical twins of someone who has shown their resilience by having no history of major depression, and they have the lowest chance, although still elevated compared to people who have not undergone a stressful life event. Yet another illustration in data of the stress, stress diathesis model. Well, it's all well and good to uh, talk about how great the stress diathesis model is. It um, is consistent with a lot of the elusiveness of explaining psychological disorders. There's a lot of data behind it showing that both genes and environment matter. But it isn't a very satisfying explanation as to why vulnerability or susceptibility should be around in the first place. Indeed, the stress diathesis model leaves three big puzzles, and I'll end the lecture going uh, over each one. One of them is an environmental puzzle. Now, uh, we kind of glibly refer to the stressful event that can uh, account for why, say, one identical twin uh, undergoes depression or becomes schizophrenic and the other one does not. But to be honest, uh, off the, um, identifying the stressful event is not so easy. Uh, we do know that even identical twins correlate only around uh, 0.5. This is the uh, third law of behavioral genetics, namely that a lot of variance is neither genetic nor may it be attributed to family upbringing. It is a... Uh, uh, sometimes called the unique or non-shared environment, uh, but actually fingering what those non-shared experiences are, the ones that hypothetically you assume have to be there, is not so easy. It's all too uh, facile to say, well, if one uh, twin became depressed and the other one didn't, there must be something in their uh, history, uh, their life history, that exposed them to a stressor, but if you simply ask them, did anything terrible happen to you over the last couple of months? Well, it's not surprising that the depressed people will be better than, be more likely than the non-depressed people to identify something. But that just might mean that when you're depressed, all of these terrible memories rise in salience. You can think of all kinds of terrible things that happened. Whereas if you're not depressed, 
The same things may have happened to you, but in a more positive frame of mind, you don't call them stressors. Just assuming there must have been a stressful event doesn't actually establish that there has been one, and, and often it's hard to identify what they are. It's possible that some of the unexplained variants that goes into the third law of behavioral genetics, the fact that even identical twins reared together aren't perfectly concordant for psychological disorders, may be uh, neurodevelopmental accidents, mutations, uh, birth accidents, just the happenstance of how brains uh, mature in utero that are not particularly predictable, but might send a, a baby on a particular life trajectory. A second puzzle, a genetic puzzle, uh, name, sometimes called the missing heritability uh, paradox, that even for traits where we have excellent reason to believe from the twin and adoption studies that genes play a role, finding the genes is not so easy. Uh, intelligence being a fine example where it's long been known that intelligence has a heritable component, but despite a lot of effort, no one has found the IQ gene. Uh, even a, a gene that gives you two points, three points, four points, to say nothing of making you an Einstein as opposed to a Homer Simpson, no one has found those genes. This is sometimes captured by the uh, what's called the fourth law of behavioral genetics proposed by Christopher Chabri, my former student James Lee, and a number of others, which is that heritable variation, which is undoubtedly real, is caused either by many, many genes, each with a tiny effect. So there may be no genius gene. There may not even be a gene that raises your IQ by four points. But there may be a gene that raises your IQ by maybe you know a tenth of a point. But there are lots and lots of those genes. And if you have been dealt a hand with a lot of them, then you're a smart person. We have reason to believe that this is the case because of results from studies of much more easily measured traits and traits known to be highly heritable, like height. Uh, everyone knows that your height, given a constant environment, depends on the genetic hand that you've been dealt. But no one has been able to find the, 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 the six-foot gene or the five-foot gene uh, in the First attempts, 12 genes were discovered, but if you add together the effect of all of those genes, they account for only 2% of the total variance, or about one inch uh, of height, put together. It's possible that there is a long tail of genes with smaller and smaller effects, but there may be dozens or scores or hundreds of them. The other possibility for where the missing heritability is lurking is genes that do have large effects, but they are rare. They're restricted to a subpopulation, a family, even an individual. And examples would be recent mutations, a mutation in the sperm or egg of your parents or your grandparents. So it may have a measurable effect. But if you do a study with a large population, it's not going to be distinguishable from the noise because only a few people have that disease uh, and that's what caused their particular condition. In other words, even if depression or intelligence or schizophrenia is genetic, everyone might undergo uh, depression uh, because of a different handful of genes. And this is true of the very well-studied sp form of specific language impairment caused by a mutation in the FOXP2 gene. Uh, it unquestionably is a single gene with a big phenotypic effect, but the gene is very, very rare. Most people with specific language impairment don't have it because they have that mutation. Finally, there's an evolutionary puzzle, which is why do these susceptibility genes persist in the population? Why isn't everyone resilient? Mental disorders, after all, are heritable. We've established that. They are harmful, almost by definition. They result in low productivity in life. People with mental disorders tend to uh, accomplish less, to have fewer friends. They tend to be unattractive, as uh, you saw, for example, for that, that, that gentleman with uh, depression and schizophrenia. They would not be very successful in the mating market. They, uh, and most tragically, people with 
Many of these disorders have a much greater chance of dying by suicide, which, needless to say, uh, imposes a huge hit on fitness. And also, they're not that uncommon. They're not just a uh, rare freak mutation where all you need to uh, point to is that uh, one rare freak one-time event. Uh, one percent in the population, even though that's, that sounds low, that's a pretty low rate for something that has such negative fitness consequences and ordinarily natural selection would be expected to weed them out. So the paradox is natural selection should have quickly weeded out any gene that reduces fitness. Why have, uh, do susceptibility genes for mental disorders persist in the population? Now, uh, in raising this paradox, there is a crucial proviso, and this is perhaps uh, among the most important lessons that I hope you will take away from the, uh, our exploration of psychological disorders. Namely, that feeling bad by itself is not maladaptive. Quite the contrary. Some degree of negative emotion, even of impairment of functioning, is actually adaptive and part of a normally functioning, normally behaving organism. Anxiety, for example, is uh, often in response to genuine threats in a person's life. And when you're uh, anxious, that could be a strong motivator. It could motivate you from uh, slacking off, from uh, letting your attention be diverted from whatever pops up uh, in the moment, when the lack of attention could have negative consequences and uh, enough anxiety that makes you study for an exam, that makes you do a little bit more research for your paper, obviously uh, helps you, even if it's unpleasant as you're undergoing it. And there is a, a lo long uh, history of research in psychology that shows that moderate anxiety uh, improves performance in a wide variety of tasks. Uh, depending on how difficult the task is, the optimum uh, amount of anxiety varies, sometimes called the yerkes dodson law or the Q-arousal curve. Even depression. Uh, in a mild, measured, situation-dependent form can be uh, adaptive. When you're depressed in response to some life-changing loss, it is an impetus to slow down, to not rush into things that might have disastrous consequences because you, uh, the world has changed or you uh, have been given a feedback signal that you don't understand the world. You reassess your goals in a world that may have changed for the worse. And as I mentioned, with the phenomenon of depressive realism, the fact that people uh, suffering from mild depression actually can be more accurate, you may not venture out and take big risks, but on the other hand, you're not going to take foolish risks either. Maybe having suffered a loss is a signal that you're uncertain enough about the environment that you should have a dead-on accurate assessment of the odds facing you. Uh, also, you don't take social risks if you have uh, just committed a huge blunder, if you suffered a big misfortune that means that uh, you're likely to alienate people. That might be the time to uh, hold back, to reassess how you've been interacting with people, and uh, when you recover, to come back all the wiser. And even the helplessness in depression might have some adaptive value in signaling to your loved ones that you need help. You're not in a um, situation in which you can cope with all of life's challenges yourself. Now, an analogy uh, of the paradoxical advantages to feeling bad comes from literally feeling bad from physical pain. There is a rare condition in which people because of a lack of pain receptors, just are incapable of feeling pain. They can uh, drink scalding hot coffee, they can uh, cut themselves and uh, doesn't bother them, them at all. At first, it might sound like a blessed existence. That's great, you stub your toe and uh, you're not writhing in agony. In fact, it is a dreadful curse. And these people die young, often in their 20s, from massive inflammation because they 
don't even get the signals that would cause them to change their position on a chair so that they don't apply too much pressure on their joints or to get bed sores from uh, too much pressure on uh, the skin. And it is a reminder that we have physical pain for a reason. They are warning buzzers and warning lights that tell us when we are subjecting our own bodies to uh, insults and um, injuries that could uh, impair us in the long run. And so psychological pain might have a function. They may be a, a warning signal, a, 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 buzzle, a, a buzzer that tells us something terrible has happened in our environment or because of our behavior that requires corrective measures. The puzzle is really not about why we're susceptible to anxiety or depression or paranoia or obsessiveness, but why should it ever become uh, excessive and pathological? Why should it reach clinical levels where it impairs the person's functioning? We don't know the answer, so I'll just toss out some hypotheses. One is the, uh, called ancestral neutrality. Perhaps in the EEA, the Environment of Evolutionary Adaptedness, the gene wasn't harmful. And we've uh, revolutionized our environment with technology and schooling and government, but our bodies and brains have not caught up and were adapted to a long-vanished uh, world. Now, this is plausible for some conditions. For obesity, because we evolved in a world of scarcity of fats and sugars. Now we produce mass quantities of the stuff. Drug addiction, we evolved in a world that didn't have um, uh, opiates and um, fentanyl and, uh, and um, uh, crystal meth. Uh, a dubious gift of our ingenuity is that we've invented them. It may not be surprising that we have no defenses against them. Even ADHD may be an artifact of an environment where we got to just sit still and look at a teacher yammering at a blackboard for hours on end or be chained to a desk and filling out uh, uh, forms on a computer screen, but that in a more natural environment, switching your tasks every few minutes was uh, probably an adaptive thing to do. It is not plausible, for, needless to say, for schizophrenia, for major depression, for uh, most of the psychological disorders. A second hypothesis is that it is a result of balancing selection, where the contingencies of reproduction don't call for as much as possible of a particular trait. A gene that may be advantageous in one context could be harmful in another. Other genes in the same organism, a mixture of environments over space and time. Sometimes there are years of fat, sometimes there are years of lean, sometimes the environment is predictable, sometimes it's chaotic. Maybe genes that were selected over a century of drought and famine are suddenly maladaptive in a uh, century of ample harvests. Uh, perhaps it may even depend on the social context of how many similar or different genes there are in a population, that it is advantageous not to be too much like everyone else. If everyone is under that selective pressure, you have a condition called frequency-dependent selection, where a stable mixture of different genes can persist, because if any of them gets too plentiful, it increases the selective pressure for the others. Uh, one uh, particularly florid and interesting example of balancing selection might be the link between psychopathology and creativity, as in uh, some famously creative people who are all also um, susceptible to depression, to mania, to uh, bizarre behavior. Michelangelo, Michael Jackson, Beethoven, uh, Hemingway, Vincent van Gogh being examples. And there is some evidence for this romantic notion that in mild form, some of the genes that uh, can make you creative and only when it's in extreme form that it pushes you over into a disorder. We do know that individuals with bipolar disorder are overrepresented in creative professions, that during the manic phase of bipolar disorder, often the juices flow, the ideas come to you, uh, the energy pushes you to explore new artistic possibilities. 
And in uh, cases of identical twins where one twin is diagnosed with bipolar disorder, the other one often has some uh, cognitive uh, advantages. They are um, better at verbal learning. They are more flu fluent, as if a certain amount of, kind of manic energy and uh, flight of ideas can be helpful. It's only when it becomes excessive that we call it a disorder. This may be plausible for antisocial personality disorder or psychopathy, where uh, if uh, we know from models of the iterated prisoner's dilemma, as discussed in a preceding lecture, that even when the uh, reciprocal altruism is the winning strategy overall, there can uh, lurk in a minority, three or four percent of the players who just do just fine exploiting everyone, uh, simply because they get all the benefits without paying any of the costs. When they get too plentiful, they start to get ostracized and punished, but still they can lurk at a um, stable but low level. That might be an explanation for why antisocial personality disorder uh, persists. Uh, and with related traits that may not be as extreme as antisocial personality disorder, but the trait of antagonism might be beneficial as long as there aren't too many of them screaming at one another. And in the other direction, conscientiousness might be favored in a world of antagonists, but uh, they might be opening themselves up to exploitation by others. Again, this works for some, but not for many others. The problem being that uh, a bit of artistic creativity uh, especially in your relatives, is unlikely to outweigh the disadvantage of having pathological bipolar disorder that leaves you susceptible to major depression or to symptoms that uh, verge into schizophrenia. Finally, a, uh, another, the most boring but perhaps the most plausible explanation is that it's the simply balance, the balance between mutation and selection, that new mutations constantly creep into the gene pool. Every time we form an egg or a sperm, we introduce several dozen mutations uh, into it because no copying process is perfect. <clears throat> Natural selection, of course, weeds out the pathological cases that can't find mates or take care of themselves, but only slowly. And it may be that uh, new mutations drip into the gene pool faster than natural selection can weed them out. We do know that every psychological system, every cognitive system, every emotion, every aspect of personality is extremely complex, especially at the genetic level. There have to be many, many genes uh, functioning properly for the system as a whole to work. So that means there are lots of things that can go wrong. And so a hypothesis is that psychological disorders are caused by mutations affecting the brain which have not yet been selected out despite their disadvantage. So this is an evolutionary explanation, by the way, that is not an adaptationist explanation. There is no benefit to having a gene that leaves you susceptible to major depression or schizophrenia, uh, but the process of evolution can explain why those genes might exist. There's even some evidence for mutation selection balance being a cause of mental disorders. It would help explain the puzzle of the missing uh, heritability, the fact that pathological conditions are highly heritable, but there does not seem to be a single gene that runs through the entire population of people with that disorder. Everyone is autistic for uh, a different reason. That is, they have a different set of genes, presumably a history of different mutations. The fact that mental disorders are continuous with normal variation, a fact that I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture, uh, and that the different disorders are uh, comorbid, as they morbidly say. That is, the same pathological symptoms tend to reoccur in disorder after disorder. Uh, if you look at the, my definitions for borderline, narcissistic, histrionic, and antisocial personality disorders, they have a bunch of things in common. Likewise, depression uh, and anxiety overlap. People who are depressed are often anxious and vice versa. Uh, most people with autism are also retarded. 
bipolar can shade into schizophrenia. It leads to the idea that there are genes that uh, may uh, degrade functioning and different combinations of them may push you over the line into psychopathology. Uh, we know that most disruptions of the genome can increase the risk of psychopathology in breeding, where deleterious recessive mutations find each other if siblings or uh, aunt and uh, uh, uncle and uh, a niece or uh, uh, close relatives uh, have a child together. As men get older, they can still um, sire children, but their uh, genes accumulate mutations. The older the father, the higher the probability that the child will have a psychological disorder. Chromosomal disruptions from uh, radiation and other causes all increase the chance of uh, coming down with a uh, psychological disorder. And environmental disruptions can increase the risk as well, suggesting that psychological disorders may reflect uh, disruptions to the whole system of brain and body, whether genetic or environmental. People suffer, who suffer a head injury have a higher chance of uh, developing a psychological disorder. Birth trauma, uh, famine. This is a graph from your textbook showing the effects of the famine caused, uh, called the Great Leap Forward, caused by some of Mao Zedong's harebrained uh, agricultural policies, which led to massive famine in China between 1959 and 1961. Uh, during the period of maximum famine, you had an elevated uh, percentage of uh, people who developed schizophrenia, if that's when they were uh, con uh, conceived. So, a lot of material. I have crammed a, uh, uh, almost a degree program in clinical psychology or psychopathology into one lecture, but here are the points that I hope you will take away. That uh, the Description of psychopathology and its relation to variation in personality. The, some of the major personality and clinical disorders. The causes of psychopathology, in particular the stress diathesis model. The evidence for genetic predispositions having a large role in the etiology of psychological disorders. Uh, but the three puzzles raised by that very phenomenon, the environmental puzzle, the genetic puzzle, the evolutionary puzzle. See you next time.